So hi, I'm Andy, uh, founder and CEO at Control Plane. We are a cloud native security consultancy that focuses on regulated industries and unlocking next generation technologies and the CNCF landscape. And uh, I am the emeritus co-chair. I spent two years in tag security and had a wonderful time. And to some extent is a reflection on some of those pieces. Uh, I also work at uh, uh, the Open UK non-profit which is UK government adjacent advisory for open source, open data, and open hardware, and contribute to the Linux Foundation Finos project as part of the AI readiness project, where we are helping uh, banks to use generative AI to write an email. Very simply, but all the governance that comes off the back of that, and uh, authorship and, and training as well. Right, so what is tag security and why does it exist? It is pure, purely voluntary-led, as per so many of the uh, Linux Foundation uh, and open source things that we know and love. And it focuses on essentially a form of assurance for CNCF projects as they enter the CNCF landscape, and therefore um, the, the sandbox and moving up, ideally, to graduation. Then the TOC and the Linux Foundation are interested in, well, is this project good for the end users? So, of course, there's governance, there are questions of how many maintainers do they have, what, what are their affiliations, all those things. We're focused on the usability and security of these projects, and we do a, a wider suite of things that includes uh, a lot of white papers and working groups uh, as well. That is all open source. So, this is the, uh, this is the repo. Everything is public on GitHub, as always. Um, we're a collection of enthusiasts and professionals. Uh, we have... Uh, a wide range of people. That ecosystem strengthening is the CNCF landscape, but by extension, that also impacts open source at large, and some of the things that we put together um, have got some uh, wide-reaching deployments. Uh, the education piece, of course, is part of security in general. How do we bring everyone, everybody along for the same journey? Uh, the rising tide uh, mentality and we engage with other communities. So a good example, of course, is the OpenSSF, which is uh, perhaps focused on open source as, as a whole from a security perspective. Uh, and we are open source in the CNCF, but if, of course there's huge convergence. Uh, we have tech leads in tag security who um, are in the OpenSSF uh, on, on governing boards, etc. So there's a lot of cross collaboration between us as well. We have a formalized charter, protection of cloud native systems, common understanding and tooling for developers, and the audit and reasoning about system properties, which uh, sounds like some abstract security stuff. We'll get concrete with that um, as we move through. So, as if we needed reminding, of course, open source supply chain security, uh, I, I hesitate to mention, our mascot is, of course, uh, a trash panda. So the raccoon is strewn liberally throughout these slides, uh, performing various uh, nefarious activities, or remediative, who knows. There's a huge increase in supply chain vulnerability. Tag security has been focused on this uh, for a long time. Um, one of our tech leads, uh, Professor Justin Kapos, has been um, guiding his students through this process uh, for many years, the Intoto project, the update framework. Uh, these are projects that all came out of his lab. Um, and we keep these terrifying statistics in mind as we sort of progress through here. So. The TAG has our charter, which is helping the governing body of the TOC and all the projects in the landscape. The assessments are the low-level security work that we perform with a view to get human, compassionate, and usable security recommendations out of the other end. Uh, we take presentations from all the projects who are looking to, to graduate. If they have a security byproduct or impact in any way, they will come and present to us for an open discourse and some feedback. Um, these working groups will talk about, and of course, the TOC formality. So, the charter is to reduce cloud native application risk. Uh, it sounds very abstract, and broadly um, is a difficult thing, because of course, security spans everything from secure by default configuration, to how is this thing being built, to what about the contributor analysis, and then the actual you know, production deployment and configuration of things um, is obviously completely independent to, uh, to the people who built the thing because it's run by end users. So attempting to make that a complete story. 
answering questions, defining security scenarios, um, identifying projects for consideration. Uh, we, we do often have projects that are looking to join the CNCF, present for feedback before they've made a formal submission. And yeah, again, the cross-pollination and external standards. So yeah, protection, common understanding, and, and the audit as well, as we've said. And the guardrails. Specifically, we are not a standards body. There are plenty of those. There is a relevant XKCD. Uh, we're not an umbrella or compliance. We're not certifying things. We don't have a, a golden kingmaker stamp that we apply to projects. We're very much a community and voluntarily led security interested group that provides useful feedback as opposed to being a classic security gate. Uh, again, we, we don't bother with devices um, unless there's some cloud impact. And the trust and safety concerns outside of cloud, we scope ourselves into what we can impact. So for example, um, some of the ethical issues around AI, for example, wouldn't be anything to do with us. But the way the AI system deploys, and Kubeflow is one of the projects that's coming through at the moment, very much of interest. So we have meetings on two different time zones. Uh, every Wednesday, we meet on the North American time zone. That is 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a Zoom call, and it's a very open uh, and friendly place to be. And every other Wednesday, uh, we have an EMEA meeting. That is on the uh, mutating um, Greenwich Meridian or British Standard Time, but it's 1 p.m., uh, whatever time it is in, in the UK. And again, it's entirely voluntary. We did have, for a while, um, an Asia-Pacific aligned time zone. It is all voluntary, so if you're interested, uh, the group is very open to expanding. So the formality of the work that we do with the TOC, we present something a little bit like this. So what have we done recently? Um, these assessments, how we're building out uh, white papers and recommendations. Uh, there was a fuzzing handbook from uh, Ada Logix, who do a lot of the work through OSTIF for the OpenSSF. Again, it's sort of cross-pollination. They present this book, and, and then we uh, provide recommendations on readability and ease of use, but they, they own the technical domain, so uh, we, we, uh, we contribute in, but again, it's, it's their work. And yeah, plenty of projects um, that we're engaging. We'll talk about those a little bit more. And then, yeah, looking at what, uh, looking at the work coming up in the future. Briefly going through GitHub, and then we'll dive into one of the issues. So these are the kind of assessments that we do. So um, Open FGA is a fine-grained authorization framework. You can imagine the security side effects. So the kind of questions we want to know are, how easy is it for somebody to detect if they've done something wrong? Or how do you help people to visualize? Is this all programmable as code, or is there UI clicking? Uh, that those kind of uh, that sort of level of interest. Um, the Kubeflow project down there was one that I was involved with, or still am involved with. And of course, for something as expansive as Kubeflow, which involves not only pluggable ML training frameworks, but also developer experience things, internal MySQL and um, object storage. It also has the Jupyter notebooks. So the first part of that review is actually delineating the system and really immersing ourselves in, in the problem space. What is this thing, and how do we get to a position where we can provide useful abstract questions without being ML experts? Because a lot of the work we do here, we're not necessarily experts in, in the domain. Uh, the Flux multi-tenancy was another one that I was involved with. Um, so of course, GitOps tries to remove a lot of security privilege from developers by inverting control. So we're pulling configuration from Git or OCI and then applying it to the cluster. That application to the cluster then involves cluster admin credentials. So at this point, we make an exemption to a best practice rule, which would be never deploy anything with cluster admin, unless it is actually your admin, and then work to say, OK, well, how is, for example, privilege delegated to the actuating component? What happens if there's a remote code execution in a part of this? Well, there's actually very few listeners, and they're segregated, et cetera. So that, that's the kind of level that we go to with some of these. And some of the things that, that are coming up, um, and honestly, this is, this is a truly fascinating part of the role um, or part of the contribution into this tag because the entire security spectrum comes and presents to us on a huge range of different things. Uh, obviously, confidential computing, I mean, we're talking about running in trusted enclaves, we're talking about um, 
encrypted images, trying to defend the host from a malicious root user. Incredibly interesting, very difficult, and tremendously entertaining to immerse again in the problem space. Um, other things we've got in there, uh, some of the policy monitoring stuff, Falco, again, um, intrusion detection for cloud native behaviors, and getting the experts who come and present these things uh, and having you know, half an hour of, of question time with them um, is deeply elucidating. And this really is, is part of the huge benefit of being part of that community, because not only do the people that I volunteer with in the group all have different backgrounds, different lines of inquiry when it comes to what is this thing and, and what are we doing, we also get direct access to the experts who are building these systems in order for everyone to increase their knowledge and ultimately to do a good job for end users and the project itself. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention the Intoto deep dive, penultimate on the list there. Uh, Intoto is a project very dear to my heart. It, is, uh, it provides the envelope signing format that basically most of our signatures and cosign, etc., is all based on now. And Intoto is the low level tool. Um, and again, it's, uh, the, the author of Intoto has, uh, has been present in tag security for many years. And uh, yes, that is actually coming up in a week and a half, I think. Uh, well worth a watch or an, an attendance. Okay, many working groups. We actually have, uh, I realize I've missed a couple off here actually. Um, many working groups. We have a new website, so you can now see everything in one place. And we've done a number of security reviews. You can see the number of those that have extremely security adjacent issues uh, or, or potential issues. Um, things like Keycloak, right? Your central authorization and authentication system probably needs to be deployed with a reasonably sensible set of secure by default configuration elements, et cetera, et cetera. Spiffy Spire, penultimate on the list, was one of the first things uh, that, that the group did um, a number of years ago. And in terms of how that was approached, because it does depend who is leading the review as to some of the elements of style for the security review or the methodology, um, Spiffy Spire builds out a security properties matrix so we can cross-reference well, what is the blast radius of certain types of compromise in uh, what is essentially an uh, ephemeral workload identity system. So Spire will rotate credentials from a, a self-signed CA very quickly, and that underpins, for example, service meshes use this. Um, Istio didn't use the exact Spiffy Spire implementation uh, when it launched, but it's, it's the... Uh, same principle. So being very clear and communicative about how security and potential failure conditions impact the project help consumers when they architect their systems, when they're making cases to their stakeholders, etc., etc. And the range of things on here is, of course, uh, really quite expansive. Cert Manager has just come through recently, again, dealing with all application level encryption for a cluster. And the thing we'll get into a little bit more deeply, Flatcar, Flatcar Linux is a distribution. So it's a, an immutable container operating system. But again, the concerns for those two projects are so far apart in terms of how things are executed, but then they really converge when it comes to supply chain, how is the build process, what about the attestations used to validate provenance, etc. Some of the notable releases that we have uh, done recently, the Secure Software Factory uh, reference paper, uh, the Cloud Native Security white paper, Th these are a set of recommendations and reference architectures, again, for inspiration rather than for um, absolute zealotry to implementation. Um, and then, of course, uh, the NIST controls mapping, how those then map into standards, etc. We do have a shiny new website. Uh, the logo is very large. There is a lot of content beneath it, I assure you. And thank you to everyone who put all the effort in to ship this. Um, it is all bright and shiny. We've moved a number of things around in the repository. So if you do find any broken external links, please do raise an issue and we will fix them. And here is a list, a more comprehensive list of the publications from the website. So uh, some of the... Uh, Secure defaults pieces, of course, aligning with legislation coming out of uh, US government, secure by design, secure by default, and a lot of long-term consideration over how does the supply chain get compromised and how do we make it more resilient? 
And that catalog of supply chain compromises is interesting reading, let's say. Uh, it goes a long way back into the 60s or 70s, I think. Right, how does one join the Raccoon Club? Uh, Lurk in Slack, we're very friendly. Meetings every week on one time zone or both. We're very open to people joining meetings and just observing because, again, from my personal growth perspective, turning up to some of the first meetings and just watching people talk about things at levels I didn't understand was edifying and elucidating and really helped me to upskill in some of the areas that I wasn't aware of. Um, when we do formalized reviews, people are welcome to just, again, read through the, the documentation or contribute in, but really the osmosis and passive understanding is, uh, is a huge part of the benefit of being part of the community. So, how do you threat model an operating system? I'm glad you asked. This is, uh, this is now complete. So we'll have a little bit of a mini retro on what the process looked like and some of the things that were causes for further investigation and interest. So everything starts off, the Flag Heart Project wants to graduate. So it goes to the TOC and says, we think we have done enough to graduate as a formal CNCF project. End up on that top tier, that gets us marketing support, it gets us the reflected glory of the company, of the other organizations and, and projects specifically that have graduated as well. What do we have to do? Somebody on the TOC, in this case, uh, we've got Duffy and Nikita, say, this has security impacts or side effects, please file an issue with tag security and work through a self or joint assessment. Now there's a distinction there, which is a self assessment is when a template is filled out and then we collaborate with the authors on the understanding, have they clearly called out the threat actors, etc. The joint assessment then takes that and goes subterranean deep. And really, this, these are synchronous meetings, these are um, presentations in the tag, and then it's a lot of offline work as well for people to asynchronously contribute into documents. We use Google Docs for that, and eventually the output of that gets codified and put as Markdown into the repo. And what we can see here is that uh, Justin led the project, a few of us jumped in and contributed. We stood up the Slack channel, so we do have something there, and off we went. Depending on who is running the assessment, this is a way that I like to do things. So when we did Flux, uh, which I was leading, and, and the same for Kubeflow, we take this kind of approach. What is the minimum effort we can put in to bring everyone up to a point of understanding, get an initial document lined out, and then review and go deep on the areas of consideration or, or potential concern? This is a really nice framework. If you look at the official, or the first Kubernetes uh, threat model, that Trail of Bits did, it is published in this kind of format. And the rapid risk assessment is the opposite end of the spectrum to the more formalized stride threat modeling process. Uh, professionally, I use stride exhaustively because it is very, well, exhaustive is the right word. The rapidity of this risk assessment makes it useful for community work and especially when people might be contributing as time is available to them. This is the way that I like to begin that threat modeling process as well. So how do people use this project? Is it as you expect? Is it as we expect? How does the project work? I mean, this is, uh, the, the string is half as long as, twice as long as half a piece of string. But again, the, the ball of twine can untangle here. So scoping this down to the available time or time boxing uh, is imperative. Subcomponents or shared boundaries. Where does data flow out of this thing into places that we might not expect? Can you tell me the communications protocol for every piece of data that moves in and out of your system between components? Is there authorization there? I mean, we hope everything is encrypted in some form. Is, is there a reliance of, upon a perimeter? And of course, most of these things are deployed into a Kubernetes cluster. They're cloud native applications, not in the case of Flatcar, of course, because that is then hosting Kubernetes or a container runtime to run other containers. Where does the data get stored? It's all very well securing everything and then pushing stuff off into plain text uh, in an S3 bucket, for example. 
data sensitivity. Do we know where the keys are? Do we care where the keys are? Um, encryption, of course, and input validation. Now, memory safety of some languages will help with some of the, uh, well, the memory safety bugs, let's say. But if data is, untrusted data is treated as trusted, I can fundamentally, we potentially have an issue. So, with that in mind, let's have a look at what happened to Flatcar. It's worth saying, this was an excellent project to work with, and this is all public. The, the team, I suppose it's also worth saying that for some organizations, they think that they're going to graduate and then realize that they have this process and things have to move very quickly. For others, they consider the duration of the project uh, or the duration of the graduation and uh, give us lots and lots of time. And this was one of those examples. The team turned up. They knew broadly what they were expecting. They were very responsive and uh, collaborated in a, you know, a, a very pleasurable way, uh, very, very enjoyable to work with. So what does this actually look like? What do we do in these assessments? Uh, so yes, OK. So we're looking at the security mechanisms and processes, assessing the documentation. And then we move to this joint review stage, uh, and the target audience is those joint assessors. So the, re the reviewers of the output of this are the tag security group who are um, assessing the project. Now, bear in mind, this is now merged down and committed. So we have actually completed it, and we'll just run through what it actually looks like. So this metadata is, is standardized. What is this thing? It is a distribution, um, the issues for graduation. They came and presented initially, so we had a, a bootstrap not only there at the time, but for other reviewers who wanted to join later on. You know, there's enough information for them to get up to speed quickly. It's a security-first operating system. Now, this is really interesting because the amount of work that Flatcard do to pull upstream kernel patches, I mean, a lot of their work as a, an immutable I guess one pertinent piece of information. Uh, the, the lineage here is uh, Gen 2 Chrome OS, which has got this Omaha dual partition uh, immutable update. Chrome OS, sorry, Core OS was then a derivative of, of those two. And then when Core OS uh, was bought by Red Hat, man, like six or seven, eight years ago, um, that rolled into Fedora Core OS. But Kinvolk, um, who have now been bought by, by Microsoft a couple of years ago, Kim Volk out of Berlin forked the last CoreOS version into Flatcar Linux and then have been maintaining this for all that time. So immutable partitions, um, there are a couple of places where you can write, but there's not many execute bits across the whole um, file system. And the execution model for applications or even binaries that are not on the system by default are to run them in a container and mount in what you need to explore into the container namespace. So the thing that they do most commonly is upgrade kernels. And they will upgrade the, uh, the, the images of, of the dependencies and the, you know, we've got LS and SSH, et cetera, on the host as immutable binaries, or the, on, on an immutable file system, rather. Um, so for each of those patches, they have to consider what exactly is changing between these versions? They, they examine all the patch sets, and then everything is signed and put into, into CI. Uh, yes, flat card distribution, so based on Gen 2, of course. And there's an update server, which is detecting uh, whether updates are required. They generate SBOMs for everything. They have a security team, um, and yes, various other things. A uh, little bit of background. And then, of course, we're immediately getting into low-level uh, Linux pieces here. There are no Linux kernel engineers on the, the tag security team. Apologies if I do anyone a disservice by not knowing that. Um, so, so again, we're talking about, well, what's the end user experience? How does this work in a supply chain context? We're not going to turn up and uh, try and challenge like low-level security implementations. We want to know about the effects and the decisions that were made rather than um, doing a, a code review or performing fuzzing. We're very much based on the safe usage and build of these systems rather than actually the, the code that they're made with. Because, you know, as I say, the uh, Ada Logics, OSTIF, those organizations do that and 
the CNCF also engages external penetration testers to perform um, that code review work as well. Uh, so flat card, clear distinction, recording the slides, et cetera. Okay, so this is, this is what we care about first of all. What does the supply chain of this look like? Because as with every other piece of software, something that is hardened and um, deploys securely, has excellent logging, et cetera, maybe it looks a bit like uh, SSH or an XZ library. If something's infiltrated further upstream, it is an insidious and very difficult to detect form of attack. So we start here with build infrastructure. So how does this work? Who owns the keys? How is that person protected? What, where's their laptop? What's the distribution on there? How do people get onto build servers to debug things? This was really fascinating because the project had done a huge amount of work to robustify and secure this. Um, we found some interesting edge cases. There, there were no smoking guns or sort of glaring emissions across the project. They'd done a really good job. But there were numerous lines of discussion uh, that, that came off the back of some of these. Well, how about if somebody used it this way? And see, of course, the air gap validation and signing. It is a distribution, it is an operating system. Uh, so very, very grateful that they do this level of thing. So once we know how things broadly are built, then where are the artifacts? We're talking about that supply chain. It is producer consumer problem all the way through. Validation of the signatures. What's the freshness and recency of this? You know, again, um, relying on other controls, the update framework does this kind of thing, signing things with whatever your preferred signing mechanism is, will also give you that transport guarantee that what the person signed and hashed is validated as the thing you've received, but that doesn't say that somebody hasn't injected something, it just says the transport between the two. So again, digging in and clarifying expectations around controls is a big part of this as well. Um, and then we really go deep here into what things actually look like and what's the effect of compromise. While these questions are often obvious to maintainers, the discourse, it's almost, I don't want to say we're a, a very large rubber duck, but to some extent explaining that back is, is a useful way to um, explore it further. Uh, what do we expect from the other parties involved? Um, I will keep on moving a bit quickly through these pieces because there's a fair bit. Um, how secure is the build infrastructure? What are the security properties of this system in the event of compromise? Uh, onto the people as well as the process. Uh, it is, of course, important to, to protect open source maintainers where things are stored. And then the actual build process itself. I'll keep on just zooming through. Uh, this is another good example. The cryptographic signing, uh, we're not cryptographers. So we know a set of ciphers that are safe to use. And as long as they're used in a reasonable way, that, that is the level of introspection or interest that we have. Um, we, we're not going to try and attack a cipher, for example. Um, on we go. And, and then again, um, having the team build diagrams in response to our questions is extremely useful. Again, the expectations of what security properties we're providing to different actors in the process. Uh, the actual process itself, how we install and deploy. As you can see, we're only halfway through. So this was really a lot of expansive work in response to questions from the team. Uh, as I say, it was really exemplary, wonderful to work with them. Um, how do we boot a Linux system in this case? Etc. Uh, Etc. Et Lib Nebraska, it, well, sorry, Lib Nebraska is the XKCD, of course. Uh, Nebraska is the successor to Omaha, which is this uh, dual partition uh, immutable switch. It's almost like pointing a NICS root at two different partitions, and it means that the operating system can roll back in case of upgrade failure while maintaining immutable state and still running what is defined to run on the, uh, the, the mutable part of the, of the, um, of the application of the operating system. Through more of this, maintainers, how this actually works, what the project actually thinks it does. Uh, again, it's um, sometimes these are not what one would expect, let's say. Um, the properties that they uh, share, 
and then all the way through the development pieces and responsible disclosure, uh, we're more or less there. And then what is the effect of compromise? And sorry, this is slightly eye watering. Um, there we go. Uh, it was collaboratively written, so it starts off with a joint assessment and then is expanded based upon the feedback and questioning. So the threat model, for example, is something that tag security generally tries to lead because we want to follow a specific process to ask leading questions. Um, yeah, for, for a, as diffuse a collection of perspectives as possible. Um, right, so that then ended up in a joint assessment. So. The, the self-assessment was a probably, I don't want to I'd do anyone a disservice, probably a, a fifth of that length, maybe. And then that is the foundation. The joint assessment was the embellishment, the addition of different questions, contexts. Those documents don't necessarily follow the same um, pattern every time, because we may be more interested in building distribution for an, for an operating, hmm, that's not a good example, but we may be more interested in the runtime hardening uh, for an operating system versus something that has no web-facing socket, for example, or public API. Uh, and then this broadly is what we then um, share back to the uh, Technical Oversight Committee of the CNCF. Um, and it's reasonably short, so I'll just whiz through it quickly. Uh, yeah, so slightly further questions and some suggestions. These are, um, again, uh, good faith uh, suggested with love rather than uh, sort of thou shalt not pass, uh, the antithesis of typical security, let's say. Um, looking at a little bit more uh, sort of hardening around um, humans merging PRs, essentially. Um, and that is more or less it. Uh, we do like Salsa, of course. Again, that's a project um, that we have contributors in. Uh, there we go. Uh, and then I, did, I spoke about that security properties for, for, um, for Spiffy Spire. It's incredibly useful to have a threat matrix where you can say, okay, well, for this compromise, these are the, these are the side effects. Um, yes, that is that. Right, there we go. And that was the joint assessment, of course. And just, when was that, yesterday or the day before? Uh, they completed everything. So this is now the final stage of the graduation process for Flatcar, and this um, mailing list entry basically has a plus one binding or non-binding comment from TOC members who have a binding vote, non-binding from interested parties or people who have supported the project in any way. Um, I should mention this one thing. We do also have a, a declaration of, um, I struggle to remember what it's actually called, uh, conflicts of interest at the beginning of this process. So each maintainer sorry, each tag security contributor for the specific project attests to whatever interest conflicts that they have. I knew the core team from years ago, um, so it's just that kind of thing. Uh, right, and more or less on time, which is rare for any of my talks, uh, that is it. We have lots of links here, lots of interesting issues. We are a very lurker-friendly environment, uh, lovely people on Slack. We're public with all of the projects and uh, we welcome any and all contributors from uh, across, sorry, I thought I had one more slide, any and all contributors from across the CNCF landscape or wider. Thank you very much for your attention. I think it might be time for a question if anyone has anything particularly pointy or spiky they're interested in. Oh, that's a fine question. How do we interact with Kubernetes SIG security? Well, we started off being called safe, and then we turned into SIG security. Then Kubernetes SIG security turned up, and I joined the wrong meeting once, and it's like, yes, there's loads of people here. But yeah, I'm, I'm just here to help, here to con because I've got, what, what, do you, what do you want to do here? I'm like, well, the same as always, I'll just, and then it kind of clicked. You're not in the right meeting, and you're offering help that you can't necessarily do. So, uh, very, Similar but different interest. SIG security in Kubernetes is interested in 
shipping security features or supporting security features in Kubernetes, it's interested in side effects of misconfiguration or non-obvious um, parts of the API, let's say, and it's really focused on the actual development and velocity of the open source project. CNCF tag security is interested in the CNCF landscape and things that broadly run on top of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes itself is one thing that we've never actually um, formally threat modeled or, or formally assessed because, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a good pub quiz question. I guess, did Kubernetes go straight in at the graduated level? I don't actually know. Um, but yes, we, we're separate. We renamed ourselves uh, to disambiguate and uh, yes, it's caused me some problems previously. Right, I will get off stage. Have a wonderful rest of the day.